it is my pleasure to invite Nick Roy, Cynthia Brazil, and Abby Jakes to the stage. So rather than go through the usual bio, um, I think I'd like to perhaps set, uh, you know, provide a setting where you talk about what research you are doing right now and sort of we jump right in. Maybe we'll start with you, Abby, on this side. <laughs> sure. So uh, I'm a philosopher and I'm working on ethics eth issues around the ethics of artificial intelligence. And there are really sort of two strands. Uh, one strand of my research has to do with actually the methodology by which we approach the questions about ethics in AI. There's, as we all know, many, many people have gotten worried about some of the ethical implications of the tools that we're building. And I think that some of the ways that we have sort of tried to approach those when we just find ourselves confronted by them have not been the right ones. So I have a series of papers that are about how we should be thinking about ethical questions around AI. And then I have another strand of work that's really about developing curricula for uh, teaching people how to uh, think about ethics of AI in the process of building them. So some of it's for uh, undergraduate and graduate students at MIT. We're piloting some work in that area. I'm working with Cynthia on some stuff around K-12 kids learning AI and making sure that they're aware of the ethical dimensions of that work. And also work for working practitioners and things like that. So all of them building curricula that can be integrated within the practice of making AI that will help people identify and address and communicate about the ethical dimensions of that work. Nick? Um, AI is a tremendously multidisciplinary enterprise, and uh, I'm sort of an example of that in that I sit in CSAIL, the Computer Science and Artificial Intelligence Lab at MIT, but my home department is actually not EECS, it's an AeroAstro. And so a lot of my research is trying to make uh, vehicles of various kinds, a lot in the air, but also on the ground and, and under, underwater, uh, smarter. Uh, if anybody here has a robot or works with robots, you know they're currently very stupid. And so uh, you rely on engineers to sort of give them the higher level skills in terms of missions and tasks, et cetera, and to recover from failures. You often have a human tightly in the, much more tightly in the loop than you probably want. So a lot of my research is how can these vehicles become smarter? How can they reason more about the world around them? How can they think about the world in the same way that people uh, do so that they can take advantage of a lot of the affordances that we build in the world and so that the robots can interact with people? Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so, uh, so I'm in the Media Lab, and of course the Media Lab is very well known for the intersection of innovative technologies and humanity. So uh, my claim to fame is I founded a field called social robotics, and really this is all about human AI interaction and partnership. So how do you create artificial intelligence, whether it's embodied in physical machines like robots or other embodiments, that can actually really collaborate with people much more in what we would regard as a partnership versus being used as a tool. So we go very deep into how do people collaborate, what is the nature of our intelligence, particularly our social and emotional intelligence that allows us to work seamlessly with others in order to design machines that have social and emotional intelligence that can support how we naturally work and think to be able to dovetail with us. We've been looking quite a lot at um, the role of AI in everyday people's lives. So you know, in my own research, less focusing on the tools for the professional and really just appreciating this unique time that we're in right now where who interacts with AI on a daily basis is very different than it was even five years ago. So we have young children to our oldest seniors living and interacting with these technologies, we really understand very little about the long-term impact or consequence of that. So I've been looking at AI to help address really big societal challenges. We look, about, look at things like the inequity of education. You know, how can AI help to close that gap? When we talk about the AI-powered economy, how can we better prepare all of society, children K-12, vocational, to participate in that revolution? We look at seniors and aging. We look at chronic disease management. So again, really thinking about these huge societal levers where AI can really make a difference in the everyday experience of people's lives. Nick, um, MIT has put AI at sort of the forefront um, in many ways, including the establishment of the quest for intelligence and 
um, which you're on, on the leadership team, as is um, Cynthia, as well as the even what I would say bigger announcement, as, at least from an investment point of view, the um, computing college where ethics and AI and computing serve as an umbrella are all inclusive. Um, can you provide us the sort of the leadership's view on why now and how does MIT broadly view its role and particularly when it comes to the Quest and the Computing College? Sure. So uh, one thing that may be helpful to just have clarity is that the College of Computing is an educational unit. Um, and so there's going to be you know, uh, faculty hiring, classes, et cetera. And a lot of that is still to be worked out. Um, the quest for intelligence is really the MIT Institute, uh, the institution putting its focus on the research questions around AI. You asked the question, why now? So we've seen tremendous progress, operational progress, in the last roughly 10 years uh, in AI systems. You know, they do remarkable things either through your phone or on the web or in your car, et cetera. Uh, we are also starting to realize the limits of some of the, some of the existing techniques like, like deep networks, et cetera. Uh, we, we recognize that they're very good at certain kinds of tasks. They're perhaps harder to make work for other kinds of tasks. And there's a fundamental lack of uh, formal rigor in the understanding and the formalism of, of these things. And so uh, there's going to be another wave of AI that takes us past the current state of the art into the future. Um, we don't exactly know what it is. But we do know the following, which is that uh, the next revolution in AI is going to come from the union of the co computational sciences and the biological sciences, because that's where all the previous revolutions came from. Reinforcement learning is an idea from psychology. Uh, the current neural networks are obviously inspired by uh, neural activity, and, and there's a much longer list. MIT is relatively unique in that we have a brain and cognitive science department and CSAIL, right across the street from each other. And there's an awful lot of faculty and students who have appointments in both entities. So we are moderately uniquely positioned to actually think about how the biology can inform the next advances in, in AI. And so, we, so to summarize that sort of long answer to your question, Rodina, we're seeing some limits in the state of the art. We know that we don't really understand exactly what's going on in the math for some of these, what are essentially function approximators. Can we look to the biology? We can bring the biologists and the computer scientists and all the other people across campus, the, 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 the social scientists, the linguists, you know, uh, uh, Cynthia's uh, um, interest in, in education. Can we bring all these things together to actually think about what's next? And if I, if I may just follow up on that, what are the ramifications, especially for the quest for intelligence, in terms of the innovation for the next wave of AI vis-a-vis -vis adoption in industry? Because while uh, you know, researchers at the cutting edge are already looking past deep learning, um, <clears throat> the broader industry, startups and enterprises alike, are still grappling, uh, grappling with what's AI. It's a top right. five priority, but I don't know in the world what I'm going to do with it. Data is important, but how am, going to, how am I going to use it? How should we think about, and I'm going to use a loaded word, at least to the two of you, the notion of a bridge between mm -hmm. um, the quest for intelligent type undertakings and industry? So uh, I'll, let, I'll let Cynthia give a longer answer, but very, very quickly, just for everybody knows, the quest is uh, structured around, as reduced said very nicely, a core set of people looking at the fundamental questions in AI, and then the bridge, and I'm the director of the bridge, Cynthia's the co-director, we're essentially trying to uh, 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 figure out how that AI technology can be transitioned from the core into the broader world over a bridge. I like to think that we're very much where we were about 20 years ago with the web, where if you wanted a website, you basically had to be a computer scientist and sit at a university in order to get a website up in like 1993. That's all you could do. And then people started trying to figure out, well, how do we actually take this technology and use it? How do we commercialize it? How do we make it? Do we have an internet plan? Do we have an internet strategy? The same thing is going to be true for AI. And we're trying to build some of the tools that make it easier for people to, uh, non-AI practitioners, to actually use those tools that have to know the guts of PyTorch and, and Python, et cetera. But that, there's, there's a campus part, and then Cynthia's really thinking about the broader world transition as well. Beyond kids, this is just a way for a lot of different people of different kind of familiarity with coding to be able to start to use these kinds of technologies to understand them as well as to design things that actually have impact in their lives. So there's an educational umbrella. The other one is really thinking about how do we, and you know, the Media Lab and MIT has a very strong tradition and engaging companies and co-designing and coming up with, you know, not just the algorithms, but also working through the uh, context themselves to figure out what are all of the facets you need to address in order to have 
these new technologies come into you know, real context. So it's within that context that I believe all of the five schools become particularly relevant. But that, that's another really important mandate of the bridge is the, the impact and how do we partner with the member companies and the institutions who come join us to participate in the quest to work together, to really collaborate together on making a difference in that area. Cynthia, if I'm, <clears throat> I could probe a bit further on that point. Um, data and data privacy is a very important um, and increasingly more important facet. And combine that with most of the children who are called five to 10 years old mm -hmm. are effectively AI natives, whether they know it or not. Yeah. Um, as we get this Google-driven platform or other big corporate sort of packaged mm -hmm. platform, how, platforms, how do you think about our children's data being captured at such a young age by these large enterprises while um, we don't know how the data will be used and we don't know, we'll talk about the ethics and the regulatory in a second. Um, how do we balance between that to having children who are truly AI natives and take advantage of this next generation? Otherwise, they will be ill-equipped to move forward in their, and advance in their careers. What are the trade-offs and how do you think about it? Yeah, that? and I think you know this is another an excellent example of why something like the Quest is really important because we don't know the answers right now, um, but we need to figure it out. So the ability to think about you know, people like Stanley Pentland and others who are going deep into new models of data privacy and security, when we think about capturing these data sets right now within an institution like MIT, we can do it under IRB approval, so that's ethical treatment of people as human subjects. We can capture a lot of data in order to design these models, but as we do this and think about how can we create AI systems that, in the case of, say, children, promote their learning, their development of growth mindset, attitudes towards learning, creativity, we can also engage people like Abby in the conversations around what is the ethics of that. How do we think about the parents, the teachers, like all of the stakeholders beyond just the child, and how do we understand the long-term consequence and impact of this. And I think this is really important as well. We're starting to, again, you know, have long-term relationships with these technologies. Like that, that's like the next, I think, uh, phase when you talk about AI in everyday people's lives. Not just something you just use as a tool, but something that you're building a relationship with. We need to understand what the uh, developmental consequences of those things are as well. So no better place than MIT and the Quest to be able to engage all of those stakeholders within the Institute as well as beyond to really think through all these facets and in an important dialogue and not the kind of polarizing dialogue that is often too seen in the media, but to really come together and say there's huge opportunity, there's huge need. We need to do this in the right way. I don't know if you have off of that, yeah. um, how should we think about ethics? And um, at the highest level, we, we gave the example of children in terms of their data, but one other you know, concern could be um, who's building the algorithms and what data sets are they using? Um, what ramifications does it have for lending to families of different backgrounds because of historical data? Um, and will, will the machines deny certain categories of our socioeconomic groups diverse in, along gender or um, background diversity? The other piece, I'm a mother of a daughter. Mostly men are doing all the algorithmic building. Their brains is, work very differently than you know, women's brains. How should I think of bias, the biases and unbiases around that? So many questions in that one, but take it however you will. You know, um, I think you're right. I mean, when you start saying like, oh, we're gonna talk about ethics of AI, it can get a little overwhelming kind of fast because um, we have some concrete questions that we've noticed there are issues around. So we say, oh gosh, you know, we've noticed that we only have the data sets that we have, and in many cases, those uh, are biased in various ways, whether because of our practices of collecting the data or because they sort of just pass through biases that are in all of us. Um, and then we have questions around um, fairness, issues of, you know, oh, well, false positives and false negatives are gonna affect different groups neg differently, and in contexts like criminal justice, that's gonna be incredibly consequential. So as AI is moving into areas like lending and insurance and health and criminal justice, we have on the ground real questions because those are domains where we have to worry about how we're treating people and if we're recreating patterns of disadvantage or making things better. And all those kinds of questions come up. And we also have all these questions that many of our 
uh, our friends uh, close to the industry get worried about these sort of existential risks <laughs> where you know AI is going to going to take over the world and enslave us all. And I think that the important thing to register is that. We can leave those sort of movie plot scenarios for now. That's not where we should be focusing our energy. We should be worried about the stuff that we're already doing, mm -hmm. especially in these domains like health and insurance and lending and criminal justice. But even beyond that, what those domains do is they highlight for us the ways that all the kinds of choices that we make in building any kind of AI are already themselves ethical choices. And so this is one of the reasons why the kind of curriculum work that I'm doing, some of the democratizing AI work that Cynthia and I are engaged in together. This kind of work ends up being really important. We need more people to be involved in building and deploying and understanding AI because it's only by looking at and engaging with the ethical dimensions of this work in the process of making it or deploying it or using it that we can actually make sure that we are making things better with the things that we build instead of making things worse. So we don't have to like think that, oh my gosh, you know, this little tool that I'm building, little recommender engine, is going to turn into Skynet to think <laughs> that there are important ethical considerations there. And so that's why a lot of the focus of my work ends up being about making sure that we're not treating ethics as some add-on at the end, that, oh, maybe we'll have somebody who thinks about that after we've made something, that it needs to be something that's continuous throughout the process and that all of us together are capable of thinking about and reasoning about together so that it's a collaborative process. And, and to that point, how does one keep up? I mean, I'm in startup land where at the frontier of experimenting, failing fast, and if we get it done right every so often, making it real big, but you know, I had a, I'm thinking of a particular company. So research papers around GANs, general adversarial networks, started show, as applied to NLP and NLU started showing up last January. By June, one of my very own startups, Tala, was already trying to put it in production. I have never seen that kind of speed. So if you're going, if it's technologies driven, not just research driven in terms of the various techniques and facets of machine learning on the how, but AI more broadly on the what, how does ethics, and I'm gonna throw a new facet, and regulatory bodies and regulations keep up? There's a big time lag. Yeah, I mean, it's a problem that we haven't cracked yet, right? But that's, so the, this very issue of speed is one of the reasons why I think that the long-term solution has to be about making all of us participants in the ethical reasoning and work uh, so that it's not something that's supposed to happen, oh, there's something built and we're going to stop it before it gets out. It's that the process of building has to be already ethically engaged. Yeah. And um, over time, when we learn all of us to do better about that, this is the point of the curriculum work, so all of us can learn this, that we can have modular tools we can use within practice that are connected to practice, so you don't feel like, oh, I'm supposed to be some ethicist, that's not what I am. It's no, it's how to be an engineer, but ethically. Yeah. And then you're right, the regulatory part of this is important, and we need regulatory structures, and what those look like is, you know, is still not entirely clear. I mean, you know, we have lots of models. I mean, every sort of engineering discipline has had its kind of come to Jesus moment when there's, when we say, oh gosh, we can't just have a wild west here. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes it's, you know, bridges start falling down. Sometimes it's, you know, biomedical engineering, it's like, oh, eugenics, oops. Um, so, you know, there is always a moment when we say, okay, we've got we've to think about how we're going to have governance of this domain. And we're, we're sort of at that moment right now. And there are lots of people working on what that's going to look like. And it will probably draw elements from some of our sibling domains, but it's, it's going to have its own face because of some of the features of AI in particular. And Nick, to that very point, um, for decades we used to hear academics saying, oh, there are no opportunities in industry for researchers. And now it's almost you have a challenge of a brain drain uh, from industry, especially the you know, still fairly scarce talent around AI and machine learning. How do you think about the people facet and sort of who's going to drive that cutting edge research that goes beyond the financial ramifications of the individual involved, but even more broadly, where will cutting you know, edge research come from and how does it get adopted in the industry? 
Uh, so that's a, a great question. I, I would say um, this is a short-term problem, and I think uh, most of us are not too stressed about it in the sense that, I mean, it's a bubble. It's a, a short-term unsustained demand, and it will work itself out. Uh, you know, there will be some rebalancing within the, uh, both within industry and academia as certain departments will grow, and, and uh, eventually we will, the universities will have backfilled the pipeline enough that industry can hire and, and we can still have our academics. And, and it has always been the case that academia is a choice that people make, and they often give up, uh, you know, substantial financial incentives in exchange for the very substantial intellectual freedom mm -hmm. so, so um, I'm not worried about that but where the, the uh, advance is going to come from they will change over time so you made the example of again again is basically just a fancy bit of math it's not that hard to adopt a fancy bit of math in industry so uh, what is by the way classical quote from a researcher come try doing it in industry it gets a lot harder <laughs> yeah well so you, using math correctly and, and efficiently is, is not always trivial without a doubt um, I don't mean to dismiss the no, complexity no, but yeah. but the point is is that like you know even and again we often you know so again the, uh, is synthesizing data and then trying to beat itself and like what does that mean and the features that the generative part of the model extracts you know what what is it actually doing and and you know there's certain things that we know that deep networks can't do which is extract they actually can't do sequential inference. Uh, in fact, uh, um, there's a debate going on right now. Is, is, is it mathematically feasible for a function approximator to solve basic motion planning problems for a robot? And the answer seems to be... <laughs> um, so uh, there's, there's, you know, there's core scientific questions that, that still need, need to be answered. But I, I would like to go back just one quick second to yeah. the conversation uh, and, and to Abby's excellent point about every engineering discipline come, has a gum to Jesus moment. And what typically results is a core understanding of the key way you behave ethically. And, and Cynthia brought up IRBs a few minutes ago. And the core of any human subjects experiment the world over is informed consent. And so long as you as a culture agree on informed consent, you will probably do the right thing. And I don't think we've worked it out for AI, but it, I think there's some consensus emerging that the core of ethical AI Deployment and research is a notion of transparency. Mm -hmm. Do you actually, are you transparent about the algorithms you're using and the decisions they're making so that if they make the wrong decision, you can recover from it? And I don't think we have consensus around that, but I think that's where, where that's coming from. And then also one of the point that you brought up, which is just the gender inequity right now through CS. I think universities screwed up substantially about 30 years ago. If you looked at enrollment in CS programs in the uh, late 70s, early 80s, it was much closer to 50-50 than it is right now. And then female engagement and underrepresented minority engagement went off a cliff. A and I, I think that just computer scientists made a series of bad mistakes. I mean, don't have machine learning conferences named after a slang for female anatomy. Just don't do that. I'm very happy that NIPS has changed its name, or to NIRPS. Uh, but there's other simple things that we could be doing to just like not disenfranchise major uh, uh, portions of this of society. And I think that is slowly starting to change. Yeah, I mean, and by the way, I see that in tech and I see that in venture. Mm -hmm. um, so I think in hard tech, we, we see that generally. Um, it's, this is an audience of practitioners. so. As you think about what could help speed things up, particularly the research that you do, whether it's on the robotic side or some facet of applied AI getting adopted in what I'll use the lingo in, in the enterprise, what are some of the things that you'd like to see that would help sort of the adoption cycle if in fact that is part of the interest? I mean, I think, you know, there are a number of different avenues and models, I think, for that to happen. So obviously, you know, institutions like MIT with edX, I mean, very strong track record of taking these materials that you could get at MIT quality education and make that widely available for free worldwide. So I mean, so that just getting the ideas out is, is one aspect. You know, I think there is opportunity for thinking about new models and, and ecosystems potentially, you know, different kinds of partnerships between academia, industry, and the startup culture as well. I think you know, there's a lot of innovation that, that could be possible there. Um, the students, you know, at MIT are extremely entrepreneurial. Um, you know, they love to do internships. You know, I think there's a lot of ways that we can get this young talent kind of into organizations and help transfer that kind of knowledge and insight. You know, even, you know, with MIT when we have corporate sponsors, a lot of times that becomes this kind of uh, special track to get these very bright graduate students and undergraduates to come into the companies do internships, maybe longer uh, programs as well. And that's a, an amazing way to transfer technology, is literally 
working together and having people get it into, into the institution. So I think there's a lot of ways that we do do it. I think there's new ways we can innovate mm -hmm. around doing it. Um, and I think as part of the bridge, these are the kinds of things we want to uh, explore. And you have some experience at the MIT Media Lab doing so Absolutely, well. yeah. Um, so perhaps a wrap-up question around what do you think some of, are some of the highest potential areas around AI, perhaps some of the more worrisome areas outside of the perceived pop culture, you know, or Musk, you know, Zuckerberg type debates on as we look forward, um, where do, we, do you think we'll see a lot of impact beyond the obvious mm -hmm. and what, what are some of the cautionary tales? Yeah, so um, <laughs> I, I, I talk a, long, a lot amongst my colleagues. I, I'm disappointed by a lot of the general discussion about AI and the future of AI that's happening right now in, in the media. And I, I really feel at MIT we have the opportunity to change that, or at least shape that story to cover different kind of assets. So this very kind of replacement AI, you know, I think we can present a different vision of AI where it not, it, it's not designed by the few for the few to exacerbate the divide, but is actually done to be inclusive and democratized to close the divide so that everyone can prosper. I think MIT is an amazing institution to put that stake in the ground and say this is what we stand for for a future with AI. You know, there's been a lot of focus on AI for enterprise and industry, and of course, you know, that's the context here. I want to see AI applied to promote human flourishing. I want us to think about AI in very different ways because it's going to challenge us to think about AI in, in, in different contexts for different kinds of beneficiaries that I think is going to advance the science and the research as well as just, again, be a way that AI can elevate everyone and uplift everyone rather than just focus on kind of the, the uh, profiteering side of it. So um, I want us to enlarge the conversation. I want us to think about a more humanistic view, view of this technology. Nick or Abby? <laughs> I think um, in lieu of a simple cautionary tale, I just want to f uh, highlight something that I've been very worried about lately, which is um, that, so I mentioned earlier, you know, we've got the sort of like, oh no, are we building the Terminator class of worries? And then we've got these more concrete gosh, ways AI is currently being used in criminal justice and lending and health and these other sort of clearly very life and death relevant areas, that seems like important on the ground stuff that we should be much more worried about right now. But those areas, as I was suggesting earlier, bring out the way that the small choices within any AI product, tool, et cetera, uh, can end up having really big effects. And so, the tricky thing with these things is the kind of uncertainty that Rudina was talking about earlier. We talk about informed consent, and I think that's going to be important. But when we don't even know how things will be used later, or we're gathering some data and we're thinking we're going to be really careful with it and we're going to use it in these very benign ways. They may be super helpful for human flourishing. But the, the really worrying bit is what's the way that what you're doing is going to hook up to the larger ecosystem of what's happening. You know, one of the most concerning things about data and privacy is the way that data from lots and lots of things that on their own might not be bad as collections of data, but once they get put together, we can have some very worrying effects. So registering how things connect to the larger ecosystem is, I think, a critical project because something that feels like a little project that seems pretty cool may be way less benign in the larger context of what else is happening in the world. And so I, that's one of the reasons that, again, to echo Cynthia, um, I think it's very important that we understand ourselves as engaged in a communal project of building things and think about how what we're doing works together. Nick, any parting thoughts? Sure. So, so that being said, I, I think we're all extremely positive about the impact that AI is going to have. I mean, yes. it is operationally a remarkable tool that we've discovered. And to uh, answer your question, Rudina, about what's next, I mean, I think medicine would be the thing that I think is going to have the biggest transformation, what it means to be a doctor and the patient experience and the, 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 the failures that happen right now that, that, that could be avoided. I think that is short-term going to be transformative. And then really long-term, you know, if we think about how human society has evolved over the last 200 years, I mean, 
it's punctuated by some substantial shifts in how we do business. So a long, long time ago, moving stuff around was really hard. And so we had to do it on water. And so we built cities on rivers. Um, and then we invented the railroad. And that opened up the, the west in this country, in Canada, and Australia, and other places. And you didn't have to build cities there. Uh, in between those two changes, we also got the telegraphs. All of a sudden, we could have communication at a distance. And then uh, we had the interstate highway infrastructure. And so not only did we have the ability to move things around very efficiently, we would have the ability to move many things around very, very quickly at a moment's notice. And we got just-in-time manufacturing. And then we got the internet and computer, and all of a sudden we could move giant chunks of information very, very long distances. Um, my prediction is that the next big punctuation is not going to come for a long time, but it's going to be action at a distance. We are going to be able to have robots that are uh, intelligent, but interacting with a human, because at the end of the day, there's always a human in the loop somewhere. And so having that human be able to actually experience the world remotely and act remotely was going to make, allow us to explore places we, uh, we're very difficult right now, undersea, in space, et cetera. It's going to allow us to, that I think a giant productivity gains are going to come also from pro, uh, that kind of transport of labor at a distance. Uh, MIT is right now got, has got a working group uh, on the future of work. And I think that AI is going to be crucial to that you know, sort of intermediation of geography with respect to labor. And that's going to radically change what it means to exist as a human in the world. And Nick, what about the relationship between humans and our bodies and technology? Do you foresee sort of whether it is uh, brain-computer interfaces, whether it is some other facet, will AI have a role in there? Well, it's already having a role by the red thing in your hand. <laughs> so, But I mean even a tighter relationship where the sense of me as the human and the sense of it um, kind of gets blurred. What happens to you when you lose your phone? My brain I've, behaves a certain way, but at least it's not in, in you know inside my brain. But yes, yeah, no, we no, have a relationship. We for have sure, a relationship. We've this all, device and we, I. <laughs> I think we have already changed what it means to be human in terms of you know I get very uncomfortable when my phone has no signal, uh, and so you're, you're right, it's going to change. I, I have no idea. I suspect that brain computer interfaces are probably going to be the purview of a small number of people. Mm -hmm. um, but thing, yes, uh, what it, our existential experience as humans will change as a result of AI, and I, I have no idea how. Yeah, I mean, I think you know the broader um, concept of extended intelligence, so how does AI augment and extend human intelligence? I mean, I think that's, that's clearly a, an important theme. It's an active research theme in academia. Yeah. Um, but phones, wearables, you know, implantables, you know, the whole kind of gamut of that, I think, is, is a really important area of, of opportunity and research. On that note, please join me in thanking Cynthia, Nick, and Abby.